Hello everyone, thank you for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for an Explorer's Guide to Understanding Dementia webinar presented by Mary Hulm. This webinar is open to caregivers and professionals. CEUs are available through the Board of Behavioral Sciences. In order to obtain your continuing education credit, please email aduguy at caregiver.org with your name and license number and other ID number. I am AJ Dugai, the Education Coordinator for Family Caregiver Alliance. Let me give you a little background on our organization. For over 35 years, we have been working through the Bay Area and across the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers that are providing long-term care. We offer support through educational classes, workshops, fact sheets, retreats, caregiver support services, research, caregiver advocacy, and more. For more information, please visit us at www.caregiver.org. For the duration of the presentation, your phones will be muted. If you have any questions, you may ask them throughout by going to the GoToWebinar question box on your screen. These questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. After the completion of this webinar, you will be directed to a survey. Your feedback is very important to us in shaping our future education programs, so we would like to thank you in advance for filling those out. Today's speaker is Mary Hulm. Mary grew up in San Francisco and received her master's in social welfare from the University of California, Berkeley. She received her clinical license in 2004 and went on to earn specialized certifications in gerontology and healthcare. After spending more than 18 years working as a dementia specialist and healthcare advocate, she founded Moonstone Geriatrics, a consulting firm focused on helping older people and their families. In addition to running her practice, she is the mental health consultant for San Francisco North and South of Market Adult Day Healthcare, as well as a geriatric consultant for Tech Enhanced Life, a company focused on utilizing technology to improve the quality of life for the aging population. Without further ado, I'll now turn things over to Ms. Hyun. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me today. I am very pleased to be able to, just, to talk about a subject that is very near and dear to my heart, and that is dementia. So specifically, what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to start by defining the term dementia. Then we're going to go through a review of some of the more common types of dementia out there. We'll also discuss how someone is actually diagnosed with this illness, and we will review some of the warning signs and symptoms that you need to be aware of if you are concerned that you or someone you care about may be suffering from this very challenging disease. Finally, we are going to talk about behaviors, specifically difficult behaviors. Unfortunately, dementia is a disease that often goes hand in hand with confusing, frustrating, and challenging behaviors. And for this, I've come up with what I humbly call Mary's Three Laws for Living with Dementia. So one of the first questions I get asked when people learn what it is that I do is, what is dementia? What does that mean? Well, in simple terms, dementia is cognitive impairment marked by dying and dysfunctional brain cells. It is also an umbrella term used to describe a range of symptoms. For example, Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia. Vascular is a type of dementia. Now, if you were to Google the term dementia, you would probably read something along the lines of, dementia is a cognitive or brain impairment marked by poor memory, personality changes, and impaired judgment. Now, this definition, although correct, would also be incomplete. 
For in order to be clinically diagnosed as having a type of dementia, you need to be having one more thing going on. You need to be having difficulty with your day-to-day -day functioning. In other words, trouble managing your checkbook, doing your finances, taking care of household chores, remembering your medications, making it to and from appointments. If you are having some of these other symptoms, memory problems, changes in personality, poor insight or lack of judgment, but you are not having difficulty with your functioning, it is not affecting your ability to function, then you do not meet the clinical criteria for having dementia. You may, however, meet the criteria for having something called mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. Now, the good news is that about 50% of people diagnosed with MCI will not get worse. They will stay where they are. The bad news, and research continues to confirm this, is that about 50% of people diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment will get worse, will continue to suffer cognitive decline until eventually they do meet the criteria for having a type of dementia. So now let's talk about some of the types of dementia out there. Now there are many, many types of dementia. In fact, there are many, many subtypes to the different types of dementia. But we're just gonna talk about a few this afternoon. The first two are Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. And I've actually lumped both of these types together for a couple of reasons. First of all, it is very, very common for people to actually have both types of dementia. I have clients who started off with Alzheimer's disease and now also have vascular dementia or vice versa. I have clients with vascular dementia who now suffer from Alzheimer's disease. The second reason I've lumped these two together is because some of the symptoms or behaviors that we see are very similar for both of these types of dementia. The causes, however, are very different. Alzheimer's is caused by changes to the brain, specifically by the accumulation of a peptide called beta amyloid, which leads to abnormal processing of a protein in the brain called tau. This eventually leads to inflamed neurons and the death of brain cells. Vascular dementia, on the other hand, is caused by changes to blood vessels in the brain. Now, many people seem to think that in order to have vascular dementia, you had to have suffered from a stroke, but that is not the case. I like to compare it to heart disease. You can be walking around with a chronic heart disease and never have had a heart attack. So what do we see when someone has Alzheimer's and or vascular dementia? Well, certainly they may have problems with memory. They may have trouble with language or with recognizing objects. As mentioned, they may have lack of insight or poor judgment. They may also suffer from something called a delusion. A delusion, unlike a hallucination, is when somebody thinks that something is happening or has happened, which could happen, but really has not. For example, my client Marilyn is an 81-year-old who suffers from moderate Alzheimer's disease. A couple of months ago, her son called me. He was heading out of town for a couple of weeks on a business trip, and he asked me to stop by and check on his mom while he was away. He also mentioned that he had left an envelope on the table with $300 cash should she need anything while he was away. So a couple of days later, I arrived at Marilyn's home. We went into the kitchen, and I immediately noticed that there was no white envelope on the table. So I asked Marilyn, Marilyn, do you know what happened to the envelope with the cash that Paul left on the table? 
Marilyn looked at me, put her hands on her hips and announced, well, yes, I do. Last night, somebody broke into my home and not only did they steal my money, they also stole my bedroom slippers. Well, let me tell you, I have seen Marilyn's bedroom slippers and they must be at least 20 years old. So what I said to her was this, Marilyn, if we cannot locate the slippers and the money, I will be the first one to call the police. But I think we need to take a look around first. And Marilyn, I want you to think really hard. Do you maybe have a, a secret place, a stash place where you put things that are valuable or important to you? Marilyn furrowed her brow, thought for a moment, and shuffled off toward her bedroom. I remained in the kitchen, pretending to look for the cash, and waited. About 15 minutes later, Marilyn came back out of her bedroom. In her hands, she was carrying a ratty, folded up, yellow towel. She put the towel down on the kitchen table and opened it up. Inside was a heating pad. She unsnapped the case of the heating pad, but instead of pulling out a heating pad, she pulled out a white envelope full of cash, and another, and another, and another. By the time we were done, I had counted that Marilyn had stashed away $11,620, all in $20 bills. She looked at me, I looked at her. I said, Marilyn, does Paul know about this money? No, she said. Do you think we should tell him? I nodded. Later that day, I gave call, Paul a call and said to him, Paul, I have to ask you, do you know about the folded up towel in Marilyn's room? Yes, he said. Do you know she has over $11,000 in there? I don't know what to do. So that would be an example of a delusion. Now let's move on to the third type of dementia, Lewy body dementia. And this is a type that we are going to be hearing more and more about. In fact, Lewy body dementia is now considered to be the second most common type of dementia in people over the age of 65. So what do we see when somebody has Lewy body? Well, my client, Patty, is a very good example. She is a 73-year-old woman who was diagnosed with Lewy body, or LBD, about three years ago. When I go to visit Patty, this is what I often find. She is very, very rigid. Her body is stiff. She sometimes has a slight tremor in her hands. When Patty tries to walk, she has to shuffle her feet across the floor. Now one of the most challenging parts of Lewy body dementia, especially for families or for caregivers, is that this is a type of dementia that fluctuates. In other words, there are some days when Patty is alert, responsive, and communicative. And there are other days when she cannot move, has a very flat affect, and cannot communicate. And unfortunately for her family, they never know in the morning which condition Patty will have. Now, Patty also suffers from another symptom that is, which is sometimes found in LBD, and that is hallucinations, specifically visual hallucinations. In other words, Patty sees things that are not there. Now, when I talk to families about Lewy body and specifically about these hallucinations, I think it's very important to point out to them that just because these hallucinations are disturbing or upsetting for them, they are not necessarily disturbing or upsetting for the person with the dementia. In fact, a couple of years ago, I had a client, a lovely 88-year-old gentleman with Lewy body, and he used to hallucinate quite frequently that a group of young children were playing on the floor in his living room. Not only were these hallucinations not at all disturbing to this gentleman, he actually looked forward to these frequent visits from his invisible young 
visitors. Now we're going to touch on the fourth and final type of dementia. And this type of dementia is extremely challenging for families and caregivers. Fortunately, it is quite rare and not found nearly as often as Alzheimer's vascular or Lewy body dementia. Now, FTD or frontal temporal dementia is a type of dementia that affronts, affects the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. Now, these are the part of the brain that keeps me from saying to my neighbor, boy, you sure got fat over the holidays. People with this type of dementia will say and do very embarrassing and very inappropriate things. It will be very embarrassing for families as they try to struggle with these behavioral changes with the poor impulse control we see in this dementia. Another thing we sometimes see in FTDs is that people with this type of dementia will become fixated on certain types of food or certain activities, or have sort of obsessive tendencies. For example, a number of years ago, I had a family come in to see me. Now, while the mom went in to meet with the neurologist, I sat down with her two adult daughters. And what they pulled out were photographs, specifically photographs of their mother's refrigerator and freezer. In the refrigerator, there was nothing. In the freezer, there were 22 pints of double-double chocolate chip Haagen-Dazs ice cream. Needless to say, I was not at all surprised when neurology later diagnosed her as having frontal temporal dementia. Another question that I get asked quite often is, well, Mary, how do we know if someone has dementia? Well, when I answer this question, I tend to approach it in two different ways. First, you can have a more formal diagnosis, which involves an evaluation by a healthcare professional, or if necessary, in what we might call a memory evaluation clinic. But unfortunately, not everybody has the access the finances or the resources to see an experienced healthcare professional or go to a memory clinic. But there are signs and there are symptoms that we can and should be aware of, again, if we are concerned that either ourselves or someone we care about may be suffering from a type of dementia. So let's first talk about what happens in a memory clinic. Now, I happen to be very familiar with memory clinics because I worked in one for over 12 years. So if you are referred to a memory clinic, you can expect to spend two to three hours there. When you arrive, you will be seen by a couple of different healthcare professionals. You will, seen by, you will be seen by neurology, who will take a formal, detailed medical history. They will review labs. They will go over your medications and they order CAT scans or MRIs to rule out reversible causes such as vitamin deficiencies or brain tumors. You will also be seen by somebody called a neuropsychologist. And the neuropsychologist will do what we call the pen and pencil testing. This testing will take into account age and education. It will also look at not just memory, but attention, concentration, and executive functioning. And just as importantly, the neuropsych testing will provide feedback about what parts of the brain are still working well. Now, while you're in with neuropsychology or neurology, a family member or someone that knows you well would meet with someone like me, a geriatric social worker. And we are going to examine that piece I mentioned earlier, functional abilities. We are going to ask questions about how you are doing. Are you still doing your finances? Did you pay your taxes last year? Are you making it to appointments? Are you able to manage your household chores? The second thing we're going to look at is safety. Have you wandered off? 
Have you gotten lost? Have you forgotten to turn the stove off? How is your driving ability? The third and final piece that we are going to talk about is planning. Because if you are diagnosed with having a type of dementia, there are things that you can and should be doing today so that you can still live the best life possible in spite of having this diagnosis. Now at the end of the afternoon, you will re receive feedback from the team. Specifically, feedback about first, whether we think you do in fact have a dementia, and also, if so, what type of dementia we think you may have. So now that we've talked about the more formal approach, let's go over some of the warning signs or symptoms. The first is the most common, and that is memory problems. People with dementia forget the things that they did, and they forget the, th the things that they have said. So they start to repeat them over and over again. For example, I have an 82-year-old client, Marilyn, with Alzheimer's disease. Every time I see Marilyn, she tells me about the Napa Valley Vineyard that she and her husband bought in 1967 and still have today. I have heard about this Napa Valley Vineyard probably 20 times. Her family, hundreds of times. But as frustrating or irritating as this repetitive story is to Marilyn's family, I think it's important to point out to them that every time Marilyn talks about her Napa Valley Vineyard, her eyes sparkle, her face lights up. Clearly, this is a very, very important, a very powerful memory, a memory that she cherishes and one that I do not see her giving up any time soon. A second area where we see changes is with something called visual spatial ability. Now the best way to describe visual spatial ability is when you are going to take a trip and you go to your closet and you pull down that giant black suitcase and you put it on the bed and you unzip it. And then you go and you get out your clothes, your shoes, your toilet kit, your books, and your computer. Your ability to take that pile of stuff and get it into that suitcase and get that suitcase closed and zipped up is what we call visual spatial ability. So where do we see trouble or problems when someone has dementia? Well, one of the most common areas is with driving. I have to say that in most cases, the DMV is not taking someone's license away because they are concerned that you lost your car or because they're worried that you can't figure out how to get home. What the DMV cares about is visual spatial ability. In other words, when you are driving that two-ton vehicle at 70 miles an hour down the freeway, can you keep it between the lines? Now, a third area where we often see changes is with language. People with dementia may begin to forget what objects are. For example, they may look at a glass of water and have no idea what it is. Or they may look at a glass of water, they know it's a glass of water, but for the life of them, they cannot come up with the phrase glass of water. And so, again, where does this cause challenges for families and for caregivers? Well, when people with dementia begin to lose words or lose their ability to come up with the right language when trying to communicate, they will sometimes replace those appropriate words with swear words. For example, a few months ago, I got a call from a daughter. Her mother is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and probably vascular dementia. The daughter called me and said this, Mary, I cannot believe it. My mother, who has never sworn a day in her life, is now not only swearing like a sailor, 
She is saying words that I didn't even know existed. So what I said to the daughter was this. First of all, just because your mother never said a swear word does not mean that she's never heard a swear word. And guess what else? Our brain does not allow us to throw away words, especially powerful, provocative words like swear words. And so what we have is someone who has a dementia, who is beginning to lose her language, her ability to come up with the right words. Well, when you combine word finding problems, poor impulse control, impaired judgment, and the need to communicate, you are going to come up with some pretty interesting conversation. So the fourth and final area we're going to talk about, and again, there are other war warning signs, but we're just going to cover some of the more common, is what we call impaired executive functioning. And I like to tell the story of some form a former client of mine, Bill, and his wife, Irene, in order to demonstrate what impaired executive functioning is. So I worked with Bill and Irene many years ago. Bill at the time had been diagnosed <clears throat> with moderate vascular dementia and probable Alzheimer's disease. One afternoon, they both came in to see me. While Bill went to talk to neurology, I talked to Irene, his wife. What she said to me was this, well, Mary, a couple of weeks ago, Bill decided he wanted to remodel our kitchen. Oh, let me add, Bill is a retired contractor. So Irene said to me, Bill spent the entire day getting out all of his tools. He brought them into the kitchen. He laid them out on the counter, out on the table, even on the floor. She said, Mary, it has now been almost three weeks, and not only has Bill not remodeled the kitchen, he hasn't even picked up a single tool. And every time I try to talk to him about it, he gets angry, he gets irritable, and he tells me to leave him alone. In the meantime, she said, I have no kitchen. I cannot cook, I cannot get in there, and it is driving me insane. So what I suggested to Irene was this. I suggested that she wait until Bill was busy, distracted, doing something else, and she take a tool, and she put it away, and she see if he noticed. And if he didn't, I suggested she take another tool and put it away and see how it goes. About a month later, Bill and Irene came back to the clinic to see me. Again, while he met with the doctors, I sat down with Irene. And this is what she told me. Well, I was pretty skeptical, but I was also desperate. So when we got back home, I waited until Bill was out in the backyard watering. And I took the hammer and I put it away. He did not notice. Later that night, I waited till he, he was in the shower. I took a screwdriver and another hammer and put that away. He did not notice. She said, Mary, by the second day, every time Bill's back was turned, I had my tote bag out and I was filling it with tools. She said it took me a day and a half, but at the end, I got every single tool put back in its place. And you know, she said, the odd thing is, not only has Bill not noticed that the tools are gone, he seems to have completely forgotten that he meant to remodel the kitchen. So here is an example of impaired executive functioning. We have a retired contractor who not only was unable to remodel his kitchen, he wasn't even able to get the job started. So now we're going to move on into sort of what I call the second half of the talk. First of all, I think it's important to note that dementia is what I call a hidden disease. And that is because in many cases, people with dementia, especially in the mild or moderate stages, appear to be perfectly healthy. In fact, from the neck down, many people with dementia are extremely physically healthy. And as a result of this, we tend to be less empathetic. We tend to expect people with this disease to be able to do 
things that, that they can no longer do. For dementia, unlike a disease like Parkinson, is not so obvious. For example, if you're out to breakfast with someone with Parkinson's disease and because of the tremors in their hand, they accidentally knock the glass of orange juice on the table, off the table, we are very quick to say, oh, he didn't mean it. It was an accident. He has Parkinson's disease. Well, people with dementia are not often given this type of respect or understanding. So I want to show you a couple of slides. And these are slides that I show to families that I'm working with, especially families that are struggling to understand the behavioral changes that go along with this disease. So this slide that we're looking at right now is a slide of a healthy brain, specifically the healthy brain of an elderly person. This next slide is the brain of somebody with advanced Alzheimer's disease. Now I'm gonna flip back and forth again because I think these slides are very important. Again, healthy, pink, large, robust. This second slide, you can see the gaps. You can see the gray areas. You can see the holes. This slide, or this brain, is probably 20 to 30% smaller than the healthy brain. So let me say to you what I say to the families and the caregivers that I meet and that I work with. The next time you are feeling frustrated, impatient, or irritated, because the person with dementia just won't listen or is being stubborn or is just refusing to do what you expect. I want you to remember this slide because in many cases, this may be the type of brain to whom you are speaking. So now that we've covered the nuts and bolts of dementia, we've de defined this term We've reviewed some common types. We've discussed how a diagnosis is made and reviewed some common signs and symptoms. We're now going to move into my favorite part of this talk. And that is the things that we can say and do differently to better manage, cope, and care for those people in our lives who are suffering from this disease. But first, I want you to listen to the following brief video clips of a granddaughter who spent the evening with her demented grandmother. In the first clip, the grandmother, who has been completely non-commutative all evening, leans forward and asks her granddaughter to throw away some empty envelopes. Empty envelopes. Let's listen to what happens. Now you can echo to the garbage. Okay, I'll throw these away for you. Hey, can you let me throw that away too? All these are empty envelopes. I'm throwing them away, okay? Can I throw them away? Do you want me to put them in the garbage? Do you want me to put it in the garbage? Oh. I'll leave them here for now, just in case. When I ask my audiences how they feel when listening to this clip, to this interaction between the granddaughter and her grandmother, I generally hear things like, I felt bad for the grandma, or I was irritated with the granddaughter. But I think this clip is very important because it acknowledges just how much the granddaughter wants to communicate with her grandmother. The problem is the granddaughter is so fixated on getting her grandmother to respond to her in the way she wants, in the way she expects, that she loses any chance of having a meaningful interaction. You can hear the granddaughter's frustration growing. You can hear her voice getting louder. In the end, she actually repeats the question, do you want me to throw these away? Six times before giving up completely and in the end, tossing the empty envelopes right back down on the coffee table. This next clip is the same granddaughter and grandmother. And in this clip, 
the granddaughter is showing her grandmother a picture of her on her wedding day. Let's take a listen to this. Here. Look in here. Who's that? I don't know. You don't know who that is? <laughs> Look. Who's that lady right there? I don't know. That's you! <laughs> So once again, we can hear that the granddaughter is desperately trying to connect with her grandmother. If you could watch the actual video, you would see that she is leaning over, holding the photograph right up to her grandmother's face. But once again, the granddaughter is so determined, she wants to get the correct response out of her grandmother, that she loses a golden opportunity to have a meaningful connection. I wonder, what if the granddaughter after realizing that her grandmother did not recognize herself, had instead leaned forward and said, Granny, that beautiful woman in the photos is you at your wedding. Can you tell me about that special day? I like to think that for the first time all evening, the two of them might have had a real human connection. So as I mentioned previously, dementia is a disease that does go hand in hand with a variety of behavioral challenges. And so in hopes of pro providing you with a general guideline for living and coping with this confounding disease, I have come up with my three laws for living with dementia. Law number one, leave logic behind. Dementia is not a logical disease, and if you try to manage it in a logical way, you will fail. Now, it is very easy to talk about this, but it is not so easy to do, and on this I can speak from personal experience. About four years ago, my great aunt Jane, who was 93 and suffering from dementia, called me one morning at 5.30 a.m. When I picked up the phone, this is what she said to me. Mary, you have locked me up on the roof of my apartment. It is freezing cold up here. I cannot believe you would do this to me. You need to come get me down. And what did I, a trained healthcare professional with 18 years of experience say? No, Jane, Jane, you are not on the roof. You are down in your apartment. You're fine. I will call you later to check on you. And I hung up the phone. The next morning, once again, 5.30 a.m., the phone rang. And again, it was my dear Aunt Jane, locked up on the roof, freezing cold, sobbing, and scared. And once again, I said, no, Jane, no, Jane, honey, you are not up on the roof. You are in your apartment, in your bed, in your bedroom. I will be by to see you after work today. And I hung up the phone. It took me three mornings before I was finally able to step out of my concrete, logical world and step into Jane's. That third morning when she called, again, cold and scared, this is what I said. Jane, I am so sorry. I will grab your winter coat and be right up to let you down. She let out a huge sigh of relief and hung up the phone. That was the last early morning rooftop phone call I got from my Aunt Jane. So again, it's very easy to talk about it. It's not so easy to do, and it takes practice. My second law, log the behaviors. I get many calls from families and caregivers struggling to manage difficult, confusing, challenging behaviors. But we cannot change, we cannot modify behaviors if we do not take the time to do a little investigation, to do some research into what is going on when these behaviors occur. In other words, what was the environment like? What were we doing? What was the person with dementia doing? And just as importantly, we need to not just keep track of the difficult or the challenging behaviors, we need to take notice of the good behaviors, 
the good days, the good moments. For I can guarantee, and all of you caregivers out, you, out there I'm sure will agree, if we can log behaviors, manage behaviors, and change behaviors, if we can reduce the person with dementia's anxiety and fear, then we will certainly reduce our own feelings of frustration. So again, we need to pay attention to the behaviors, we need to track the behaviors, and we need to write down what works and what doesn't work and share that information with each other. My third and final law for living with dementia, let it go and don't say no. If you are caring for someone with dementia, no matter how frustrating, difficult, or bizarre the behavior, you need to ask yourself two simple questions. Question number one, are they safe? If the answer to that question is yes, then we move on to question number two. Does it matter? Does it matter that your dad thinks he's in Connecticut when he's in California? Does it matter that your demented wife thinks it's Christmas when it's the middle of July? If someone with dementia says to me that the grass is blue and the sky is green, my answer will be, and what a lovely shade of green it is. We need to remember that there is nothing we can say or do to change the beliefs or the mindsets of someone suffering with this disease. The best thing we can do is practice stepping out of our logical world and stepping into theirs, no matter how upside down that world might be. So I know that we have covered a lot of information this afternoon, but if there is only one thing you remember from this talk, I hope it is this. Dementia is a brain disease and the people suffering from this disease cannot help the things that they do and the things that they say. And at the end of the day, it is not about being accurate or correct or right. It is about staying connected. We, their family, their friends, their loved ones, we need to give ourselves permission to say and do whatever it takes to maintain that most important emotional connection, that human connection. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mary. That was some very helpful information. And we thank you for taking the time to share it with us. We have a few questions that listeners have for you. The first one I got was about a medication that's called Respiradol. There have been two documented cases of death from this drug, and this person wants to know what are your thoughts on administering this drug to dementia patients? Well, unfortunately, because I am not a doctor or a nurse, uh, medications are out of my scope of practice. Um, I can speak generally about what I have observed as a social worker um, in some of my clients. I have seen those types of medications sometimes help clients who are very agitated or paranoid. Um, with dementia, we really try to steer away from medications because really behavioral management in most cases is the way to go. So what I would recommend is if you have questions about these types of medications, you ask a doctor or nurse or nurse practitioner and they can give you very specific information about the black box warning related to these medications. Thank you. And then I have another question. If I think someone may have dementia, but the person does not want to see a doctor, how can I get help? Well, that's a very common problem, uh, actually. Many people who are suffering from memory problems or perhaps dementia are very hesitant to see a doctor. 
uh, one of the problems is that one of the symptoms of dementia is lack of insight, which means people that suffer from this disease do not have the insight into realizing that they have a disease. Um, so generally what I would do is recommend that, you know, we are allowed to talk to physicians. Doctors, because of HIPAA, cannot give us medical information about a patient, but there is nothing stopping you from contacting this person's healthcare professional to let them know your concerns, to let them know some of the symptoms or signs that you have witnessed, um, and to give them some feedback about what is going on. Thank you. And is there a cure for dementia? Not yet. Uh, no, there is not. There are medications now that may slow the progression of this disease, uh, but there is no cure. Um, there is a lot of research going on at the moment, um, but it does remain a terminal illness, unfortunately. Okay. And how can I reduce the risk of getting dementia? Well, they're doing a lot more research into the in, into reducing the risk. And again, we, we don't have a way of presenting, excuse me, of preventing this disease. But what the research is showing in terms of the things that we can do in order to hopefully reduce our risk are the following. The first one nobody likes to hear, physical exercise. What is good for your body is good for your brain. And the research is showing that regular physical exercise may play a role in, again, helping to reduce the risk of you getting dementia. The second one is keeping your mind active, an active body and an active mind. But specifically what it, the research is showing is that it's not so much about doing something that you already do and then doing it more in other words, if you like to do crossword puzzles, it's not so much about moving on from the medium challenge, the medium difficulty to the advanced. It's actually about trying to do new and different activities. So if you've never learned a language, maybe trying to learn a language. If you've never used a computer, taking classes on how to do computers. So it's about getting out of our comfort zone and trying new and different types of activities. The third um, part of research is nutrition. And we are hearing more and more about what we call the Mediterranean diet. And that is a diet that is low in red meat, low in meats, high in grains, high in fiber, fruits, and vegetables, um, up to one glass of red wine a day. Um, so the Mediterranean diet, oh, also fish. Fish are very important. Uh, so keeping your brain active, keeping your body active, and sticking to a Mediterranean type diet may all be helpful in helping to prevent your risk of getting this disease. Thank you. And then I have a question that was sent in that says, how do we talk to caregivers about concrete ways to communicate with their loved ones without the right thing re reflex while simultaneously providing empathy for the frustration that caregivers feel? Can you repeat that question for me? So they're asking, how do we talk to caregivers about concrete ways to communicate with their loved ones without the right thing reflex while simultaneously providing empathy for the frustration that they feel? Okay. Um, in terms of communicating concrete things, because we, we need to do that, um, what I recommend is, first of all, when someone has dementia, their ability to process information is very impaired. So if you speak to them very fast, they are not going to understand you. So when I talk to caregivers about how to communicate, I recommend the following. First, I recommend you speak very slowly. Second, I recommend you break your request up into very simple pieces. For example, instead of saying, okay, dad, get your, let me start over. 
okay, Dad, get your coat. We're going to the doctor's. I'll meet you at the car. What you need to say is, Dad, get your coat. And then we stop and we wait for Dad to get his coat. Once he's put the coat on, we say, let's go to the car and let him go to the car. And once he gets in the car, then you can say, we're going to the doctors. People with dementia not only can't process information quickly, they can't retain it. And when we speak quickly, when we expect them to understand us, we're gonna probably fail. So speak very slowly and keep it simple. I hope I answered the question. There might have been a second piece to that, AJ. Um, I think you covered it. They're kind of wanting to know how to talk to caregivers about how mm -hmm. to deal with how frustrated they are. Okay. Let, let me add two more things. Keep it simple, break down the information, and speak slowly. Um, but also, less is more when it comes to information. Um, people with dementia tend to retain maybe a piece of information. And so when I talk to families or I talk to caregivers about things, one of the ways to avoid what we call the repetitive questions is number one, do not tell people with dementia information too far in advance. For example, if you tell your dad with dementia that he has a doctor's appointment tomorrow at two, what may happen is that the only piece of information that sticks in his brain is appointment. And so what you may get for the next 24 hours is, where are we going? When are we going? What are we going to? How are we going? When are we going? This repetitive, repetitive, repetitive loop. So what I recommend to families and caregivers is we don't tell dad that he's going to the doctor, if you can help it, until you're actually walking into the doctor's office, okay? It is not gonna help someone with dementia to give them this information. If anything, it is only gonna to lead to them becoming anxious and upset, which means you are going to become irritated and frustrated because they are only gonna hang on to one tiny little piece of information. Okay, thank you, Mary. And this question kind of ties into that. As a caregiver that's often frustrated, how can they monitor and change their behavior? Uh, that's very hard to do. Um, it, it's very hard to do, especially for logical, uh, concrete thinking people. Um, and so I suggest to people they, they have to practice. I have one, I had one wife, she's an engineer, and she, she was really having trouble with this. She's very concrete, very logic, very fact-driven. Um, and she has a post-it note on her bathroom mirror that she looks at every morning when she's brushing her teeth. And it says, does it matter? And so she is starting to train herself when her dad says things or does things to just stop and say, does it matter? Does it matter? Because you know what? In the scheme of things, at the end of the day, in most cases, it really doesn't matter. And at the end of the day, we do not want to look back and see that the last years or months or weeks that we spent with someone we love that has this disease is spent trying to be right, trying to correct them, trying them to get trying to get them to remember things that they can't remember, okay? That's not what it's about. That's not what it should be out about at the end of the day. Thank you, Mary. And the next question is, does vascular dementia progress and get worse? And to tie into that, can, is it possible to have vascular dementia and regular Alzheimer's? Uh, vascular dementia can get worse, absolutely. Um, and that's the, where those MRIs and those CAT scans are helpful in terms of visually seeing changes to the blood vessels in the brain. Um, in terms of the Alzheimer's vascular connection, absolutely. You can have someone that has changes to the blood vessels in their brain that has the vascular dementia, and then they can also have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and it's quite common, and we don't always know. Um, sometimes it's not necessary or relevant to do detailed testing, 
the way we look at it is if we're not going to change the medications and if we're not going to change the treatment plan and if the diagnosis and testing is going to cause anxiety or upset for the person, then maybe we don't really need to do it. Okay, thank you. And how do you manage someone who wanders? Ah, wandering. Wandering is a big one. That's one of my favorite topics. Um, first of all, I think it's really important to point out the difference between the term wandering uh, and the term eloping or escaping. In my experience, most people with dementia are not elopers or escapers. They are not trying to break free. In my experience, in many cases, people with dementia are at risk for wandering. And so I like to say to people, when was the last time you were standing at an elevator waiting for it and some four-year-old kid comes bursting through the crowd just to push that elevator button. Well, I believe that people with dementia are just doing what they've been trained to do or what they've been doing since they were children. When they see a button, they press it. When they see a doorknob, they turn it. And so the best thing that we can do is cover the button or hide the doorknob. So much about managing this disease is, is about making adjustments to the environment. But again, to realize most people are not elopers. They are just opening a door because it's there. Okay, thank you. And we just have a few more questions. What causes paranoia with dementia patients? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, I, I don't know for sure. I can tell you what I think may add to people with dementia getting paranoid. First of all, whenever I think about someone with dementia, I try to imagine myself in their shoes. And I try to think what it must feel like to not be sure of where you are, of who you're with, of what you're doing, and you have someone looking at you and talking to you like you really should be knowing what's going on, but you don't? Well, a couple of things. First of all, I imagine that would be exhausting. Exhausting to go through your day trying to keep track of where you are, what you're doing, who you're talking to, and what you're supposed to be responding with. Um, in terms of the specific paranoia, well, guess what? If you put your wallet down and you forgot where you put it, you may think somebody took it. If you lock the door and then unlock it, but you forgot you unlocked it, you may think someone tried to unlock the door. So I think part of it is environmental and what goes hand in hand with not having memory, with not being able to keep track of things. In terms of the physiological causes, I have no idea. Okay, and then one other, this is the last question, how to deal with someone who forgot who forgot they ate? Who forgot they ate? Well, I guess that, that depends if they need to lose weight or not. Um, I have clients that are overweight, and uh, if they're forgetting to eat, that's not necessarily a problem. Um, I do have clients that are at risk, though, of, get, of losing weight because they forget to eat. Um, and in those cases, it, you just need to cue them. You need to put food that they like in front of them or you need to offer rewards if they'll eat something healthy. Um, I had a client years ago, this wasn't about food, but it was interesting. Uh, the family came in to meet with me and I asked them how their mom was doing and they said, well, you know, we're, we're not so worried about her memory. What we're really worried about is that we think mom's become an alcoholic. And I, it was three boys, adult boys. I said to them, what do you mean? And they said, well, you know, when we call mom now, and talk to her on the phone in the evenings, it sounds like she's drunk. And so we had the housekeeper go in and check, and the housekeeper reported finding a bunch of champagne, empty champagne bottles in the recycling. And uh, the kids, I said to the kids, well, was your mom a heavy drinker previously? And they said no. So we started to talk a little bit more, and as we talked, this is the story that came out. Their mother was a very busy mom with four children and a husband who was a very successful doctor. And at the end of every evening, as a reward for sort of getting the kids in the bath and in jammies and bedtime stories and all of that, 
she would pour herself one glass of champagne. Well, what we finally realized was their mom was not an alcoholic. She had very, very amnestic Alzheimer's disease. In other words, she had absolutely no recent memory. And so this woman, at the end of the day, was pouring herself her one glass of champagne over and over again. And so yes, memory is very important in terms of helping make sure people with dementia get appropriate and adequate nutrition and not to uh, start pouring themselves four glasses of champagne a night. Thank you, Mary. So that's all the time we have for questions. Please, please feel free to contact Mary. Her information is on the slide if you have any questions that weren't covered. Thank you for everyone who has participated in the webinar today. And again, you will receive a survey after you exit. And we'd really appreciate your feedback for our future programs. Thank you to Mary for joining us, and this webinar is now concluded.